OK, so what we're going to do in this section is look at another way of evaluating expressions. And what we're going to do is compile them and then run them on a virtual machine. So just to remind you, we have these two different routes of, of doing evaluation, a direct evaluation of um, an expression to a value, or we could go first to compiled code and then execute that code on a virtual machine. And it's the second approach that we're taking in this section. So what I've got to talk about, first of all, is the virtual machine that we're looking at. And the, the machine that we have is a stack virtual machine. It uses a stack to hold intermediate values. Um, and for example, the first instruction we have is to push a value onto the stack. And you can see that illustrated in the graphic here. If you start off with a stack with 3 and 7 on top and you push 8, then 8 appears on the top of the stack. So that's one instruction. We have three other instructions. The second is a fetch. Um, that's fetching the value of a, of a variable. Now that works just like push, except that the value has to be fetched from the environment. In this case, we've got the variable A. That value has to be fetched from the environment. It's looked up and the value is 4. And we put that value on the stack. So push and fetch both push um, values onto the stack, either literals or values of variables. And then we have two operations for performing arithmetical functions. We have add, which takes the top two elements of the stack, pops them, adds them together, and then pushes the result. So you can see here that we have 8 and 7 on the top of the stack. We pop those, add them together, get the result 15, and push that back. And in a similar way, we do exactly the same with a multiplication. So if we have 8 and 2 on the top of the stack, we pop those and replace those on the top of the stack by their product, which is 16. So those are the four operations that we have, the four instructions that we have on our virtual machine. What I want to do now is take you into a demonstration of how that works. So we've got the code here for a particular expression. And let's see how that, that works out. The first in, instruction is to push 2, and that pushes 2 onto the stack. We then push 3, so that's pushed on top. The third instruction is to fetch A, and that's fetch, and we put the value 4 on top of the stack. And now we hit a multiplication instruction that takes off 4 and 3 and replaces them with 12. And then finally, we have two values on the stack. The add instruction takes those two values off, adds them together, and replaces them with their sum. So at the end of the run of the machine, we have a single value there on the stack. And recall, we started with an empty stack. So that shows you the, the sort of trajectory for computing the expression that we've been computing all the way through this, this masterclass, this 2 plus 3 times 4. And incidentally, that shows you that this is indeed the compiled code, or one way of compiling the code for that expression. So we've seen that that code works. We've also seen how it works. So that's what the machine looks like. What we have to do next is think about how we're going to code all that up in Erlang. So what we have to do is to think about how we represent all these things. How do we represent machine instructions in Erlang? How do we represent running the machine? And how do we code up compiling an expression into a sequence of instructions? So those are the three things we're going to have to think about doing. And what we do, first of all, is think about how to represent these things as types. So what will be our type of instructions? Well, we've seen there are four different sorts of instruction. So we're going to have four different kinds of expression uh, four different kinds of data that represent instructions. And as we did previously with expressions, we use an atom to tell us which kind of, of um, instruction we have. So that's the first field in these tuples. Some of them are, are just a single field tuple, the two um, operation instructions. And then the two instructions for data, we have a push with an integer component and a fetch with an atom, which is the variable. And then we have to think, we've got, we've got a type of instructions, what will a program look like? And the answer is we'll use Erlang lists. 
So we've got a list of instructions represents a program. As we saw in the example earlier on, we've got a list of, of five instructions for our example expression. And we'll also use Erlang, Erlang lists to represent the stack, and that will be a list of integers. So these are, the, these are the types that we're going to use to represent the, the, the virtual machine, its compilation, and its, its running. What we want to think about now are the functions that we're going to write to do the work of our implementation. And we really have two major functions we have to think about here. The first is to compile an expression into a program, and that will have the type or it takes a single expression and returns a program, which is a list of instructions. The second is the function that will run a program. And so what that will have to do is take a program and an environment to look at values of variables, and will return the result of running that program, which will be an integer. So as a first stab at those types, that's what we have. There's a problem, though. When we think about running a program, when we run a complete program, it will run with an empty stack. But in general, once we've started running a program, the stack will no longer be empty. So in fact, what we want to do is describe the run function as a function taking three arguments. That is, the program that we haven't yet executed the environment and a stack, which is the stack at that program point. And taking those three values, what we can do is return an integer, which is the result of the whole thing. So now we've got those two functions. The compiler takes an expression to the list of instructions, and the run function takes a program, a list of instructions, an environment, and a stack, and gives us a result. OK. So what we've got now are the targets. We know the types of the things we're going to implement. What we have to think about now is about how to do it. OK, so now we need to think about running the stack machine. And what we will be doing when we run the stack machine is we'll be running it one instruction at a time. So as we structure our program to run the, the program, what we will do is match on the next instruction to execute. So you can see here we have four cases describing the four different kinds of instruction which might be the next one to execute. What we're doing is pattern matching on the first variable, which is the program, and we're matching on the first element of that. So we're assuming there's program left to execute, we match on the first element, and then the remainder of the, the program we call continue. In the first case, what we're doing is matching a push instruction. And remember, what a push does is it takes the value in the instruction and pushes it onto the stack. So after that, we still have the remainder of the program to execute. That's the continue. The environment isn't changed. But now the stack will be different. And we will see that in the, the right-hand side that we have here. You can see now the program to run is continue. The environment is the same, but we've got an extra value on the stack. In a similar way, when we look at the case for fetch, what happens, we'll do exactly the same, except the value that we push onto the stack, we will fetch using our lookup function from um, the previous section. So we, we look up the value in the environment, and then we push that value onto the stack. So you can see that happening here. So in both of those cases, we did a pattern match only over one of the three arguments. We looked inside the program, but we just matched by a variable the environment and the stack. In the case of the other two instructions, we do something a bit more sophisticated. This is really where you can see pattern matching at its best here. So what we have is we match on the program to say we have an add instruction at the head and a continue. We match on the environment by a variable, but we say there must be at least two values on the stack. And if we're in that situation, we're able to take those two values off the stack and replace them by the sum. So you can see here, we've, this only matches in a situation where there 
There is an instruction saying that, and there are at least two values on the stack which can be added. So this will fail if you call an add where there's one value or zero values on the stack. That's fine. We're just programming for the correct case. And as you can imagine, if we deal with multiplication, it's exactly the same, except that we, we um, combine the two values at the top of the stack by taking their product. So those cases give us the four cases where there are still instructions to run. And what we've done in each of those is the body of the function is another call to the run function. And this is an example, a trivial example, of tail recursion. So what we're doing here is, instead of computing a value directly, we're effectively going around a loop, updating the values of the parameters. So this is like an imperative loop. Um, what we're doing is looping through the one instruction at a time, updating the program by chewing up the values and updating the stack correspondingly. So we're running through the program one instruction at a time. There are no jumps or anything in the program. It's simply a straight line piece of code. We have a final case where we have no instructions left. And in that final case, we assume we just have one value left on the stack. And the result there is to return that value. And if there are more than one value, or if there is no value, again, we'll raise an error. So we've covered the, the correct cases only in this definition because we assume that the stack machine is running with code that has been properly compiled. It's not running with arbitrary code. It's running with code that, that should run properly. OK, so there we've seen in detail our stack machine. We've used pattern matching in a sophisticated way. We've used types to represent the various different kinds of instructions. And we've used lists to represent the workhorse data structures of a, a collection of program instructions and, a, um, and the stack. What about compilation? So we know how to run a program. How do, we, how do we get to a program? Well, the answer to this is relatively straightforward. Um, we compile a number, just a simple number, by pushing that, that number onto the stack. We compile a variable by fetching its value, putting it onto the stack. Um, what about compiling the, uh, the addition of two expressions? What we do here is, first of all, compile the code for the first expression, which we assume will put the value of that on the stack. We then run the code for the second sub-expression, which will result in putting the value of that on the stack. So after running the compiled code for E1 and the compiled code for E2, we have their two values on the top of the stack. So then we execute the final addition. And that's what you can see here. We've compiled E1, we concatenate it with the compiled code for E2, and then we concatenate it with the single list, the singleton list that contains the add instruction. And exactly the same in the case of multiplication. So there you see it. We have compilation, we have execution, and we have, um, we have implementation of the, um, the stack machine. So what we've seen there is how Erlang is used to, in a more sophisticated way than doing simple recursion. We've used more complicated pattern matching. We've used tail recursion to give us the, the effect of a loop. So you can see that functional programming allows us to do things that imperative programmers might do, but in a much more high-level way through using pattern matching. Um, and I think the other thing to remind you of here is we very much adopted the philosophy of let it fail. We program for the case where things are all going to work properly. If somebody tries to execute a program that isn't properly compiled, it will fail. And the person calling the, the function has to deal with that themselves. So that concludes our second session on evaluation. We've seen that we can do direct evaluation, but we can also now do compilation and execution. And these are standard things with, with uh, small languages. You may well want to compile a language like Flash into something like HTML5 to, um, to get 
more efficient execution or compile Flash into JavaScript, say. So there are, even if you're not doing something like writing a compiler, the process of compilation, the process of language translation is pervasive. So what we'll do in the next session is look at how to move between a textual representation and a, um, a structured representation. We'll look at parsing. Okay.